Did you know that an estimated 98% of dating relationships fail? If you are dating right now, you need to make sure that you finish this video so that you can stay in that 2% of successful relationships. I don't want you to lose the love of your life. In my clinical experience, first as a couples therapist and now as a relationship coach, and as the creator of a proven system to fix relationship issues, I know that there is a number one core reason that relationships fall apart. So if you want to make romance work in 2024, you must know this relationship issue and what to do about it. I am Adam Lane Smith, the attachment specialist. I've been helping people in psychology and relationships for over 15 years now. I am here to help you build a fulfilling and fruitful relationship for the rest of your life. Now, as part of my ongoing work, teaching you about healthy attachment, secure attachment, and great relationships. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the disconnection between people who have an anxious attachment style and people who have an avoidant attachment style. This is one of the most common pairings in attachment issues. I see it all the time. My comment sections are flooded with this dynamic, okay? I've created multiple resources to help you fix this, but today I wanna to show you exactly how the difference drives the worst, most painful breakups you've ever heard of and what you must do in this romance to make it work. So if you're an anxious partner or an avoidant partner, today I'm gonna to show you how to fix that and make it work. Let's get right into it. Now, to understand this huge relationship danger, you must understand attachment theory, which I'm currently in the process of updating now based on all my clinical experience, my training, my former license, my, my degrees, everything, okay? I'm updating it. And for those of you who are new to this channel, welcome, I'm glad you're here. You're going to learn something very important today that most therapists don't even learn about. I know because I've traveled around through the West and talked with multiple mental health experts all over the place who tell me, that they did not learn attachment theory in school, and now that they've understood it, it becomes the most important thing that they've ever heard, okay? What is attachment? Attachment is the way that we as little children connect to the caregivers who give us our needs and take care of us, okay? Either we connect fully where they collaborate with us, we feel safe, we feel heard, we can talk with them, we can make mistakes, and they help us correct them, and we feel loved in that relationship and we grow up in that for that first 12 years and form really secure attachment or we don't something goes wrong it could be that we were in the NICU and we are terrified for the first few weeks or even months of our life and nothing really corrects it even if we have good family it could be abuse it could be drug issues and parents. It could be neglect. It could be that the parents themselves have trauma or attachment issues. It could be that they don't have the parenting skills necessary to give that loving collaboration to the child. It could be that the parents are endlessly stressed. It could be the parents get divorced. There's all kinds of things that can break attachment, but what the child learns is that they will not be safe and secure in those relationships, so they have to take matters into their own hands, okay? There's two key ways that attachment really can break. One is to blame the self. And some children develop what we call anxious attachment style. I've split this in two, into toxic anxious and nurturing anxious based on how far into the resentment pattern they go. But here's what you need to know. Anxious attachment is based on the belief that deep down on the inside, there is a problem with you that everybody else will see if you open up and it is absolutely unlovable and unacceptable. So if they see it, they recoil in horror and you will be cast out to live outside of society in the rocks and the weeds. You're gonna have to go live under a bridge somewhere with coyotes as your only friends. And even they won't like you very much, but they'll barely tolerate you. That's anxious attachment style. They learn that if I please my caregivers, maybe they won't abandon me. Fear of abandonment is the number one fear with anxious attachment style, which is why they also fear being exposed, being revealed, massive imposter syndrome, massive fear of being shown as a fraud, all kinds of things come out. They always feel like a fraud no matter what they accomplish. Anxious attachment style, okay? In relationships, they act approval seeking. They cover up their own needs. They try to make everybody else happy. They are always, always afraid, always anxious. They wake up in the morning thinking, how am I going to screw up today? And how do, I, how do I make people feel good and feel happy so they don't leave me? They go to bed at night rehashing the problems and the bad behaviors they did, desperately hoping nobody abandons them overnight during the course of sleep. In relationships, if they get a text and they text back immediately and then don't get a response... <gasps> After five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, they don't get a response. That person has realized I am garbage and they don't love me. Eventually, unfortunately, 
uh, what they do is they bring out a lot of resentment in themselves because they please and please and please and please and please, but they can never ask for what they need. So then they get angry and resentful that nobody is caring for them. After a while, they actually start to feel like I've done enough. Even if I am human slime, I've at least done enough to earn something. Please give me something. But nobody knows what they want. The benefits that anxiously attached people bring into a relationship, they are very empathetic. They're very compassionate. They know what it's like to feel scared. So they try to help others not feel scared. This is more that nurturing anxious style that I talk about. If you focus primarily on caring for others, compassion, nurturing, being sensitive, being thoughtful, making sure other people don't feel out of sorts, that you don't step on other people's toes, this is very much usually a process of the anxious attachment style. Again, because they know what it's like to be in that pain. The risks that they bring, though, is those unmet secret needs. Dr. Robert Glover, in his book, No More Mr. Nice Guy, talked about nice guy syndrome and how they form, form secret contracts, right? Secret contracts. I will do 10 nice things for you, and in return, you will be so grateful you'll do this one thing for me, but I'll never ask for it. You're going to have to figure it out. If you care about me, you will figure it out. This is anxious attachment style. And the more resentful they get, the more toxic they become in a relationship. That scale, right? The spectrum from nurturing down toward toxic with massive levels of resentment, especially toward their own children or toward people they have control over in some aspect. And that happens a lot because anxiously attached people are often codependent. They find people who have big needs so they can meet those big needs forever and that person can never leave them because now that person is dependent on them. They need to be needed in order to form that feeling of safety. This is why anxiously attached people tend to chase people with massive problems. They also tend to attract people or be attracted to people who don't give them the full approval they're seeking because it reactivates that old fear of abandonment and makes them say, I have to prove you wrong. I will chase you and show you why you're wrong. So they chase. This leads us right into the other way that you can break, which is blaming other people. Not hating other people necessarily. The avoidant attachment style is based on the belief that other people will be unregulated, undisciplined. When they get stressed out, they will act immorally. They will turn on you. They will be selfish. And especially that they will be arbitrary and uncaring. Avoid an attachment style. They grow up believing that other people will simply never be trustworthy. So they never trust anybody. They only trust that other people will be unreliable. So they become lone wolves. I call this lone wolf syndrome. Now there's a spectrum here. Hating people and saying, I have to manipulate them to get my needs met. I'm going to do what I have to do to survive slides down toward manipulative avoidant attachment style. But there's plenty of people, most of them, who are ethically avoidant. They are horrified at the idea of stomping on somebody else's free will. They don't want to harm anybody, but they also don't want to be harmed in return. So they tend to stay withdrawn from relationships, or if they do get in them, they're very caring and considerate, but they also are very nervous and pulled away, and they don't open up all the way. Usually they are on the dopamine cortisol pathway, where they have endless cortisol and they soothe it with dopamine. Unfortunately, that blocks their receptor sites for oxytocin bonding, so the deeper bonding doesn't happen, so they don't ease into full relationships. They are more likely to try to throw dopamine at their partner, but with an anxious person, when someone throws dopamine at you, you actually get oxytocin, and it makes you biologically and, and neurologically addicted to that person, and especially their approval, because it's what you've been seeking all of your life. So a lot of avoidant people accidentally love bomb and create a massive spike in the anxious person. Some manipulative people down on the manipulative spectrum, manipulative avoidant attachment style, do love bombing on purpose, but the ethically avoidant people don't do it on purpose. They don't actually realize what's happening. They think it's dopamine. Now, in relationships, they avoid conflict. They avoid intimacy. They avoid openness. They avoid exposure. Again, they avoid anything that's really emotional because they're afraid that's going to trigger the other person into being irrational and hurtful. So they still will do pleasing behaviors, not approval-seeking behaviors, but pleasing behaviors to try to keep other people's mood high so other people are unlikely to turn on them. Now, the benefits of, of avoiding attachment style, very vigilant, awareness of risks, careful, thoughtful, Usually very, very maxed out focus on resources, acquisition of resources. They're great at business, great at finance, great at rules, great at contracts, great at spotting dangers. They're fantastic. This. Some of the research in the last 20 years 
indicates that there may be a group benefit if one person has avoidant attachment style, but only if that person is able to bond to the group and the group is really able to bond to that person in return, then they can bring healthy features of that focus on risk. Now, unfortunately, avoidant people bring tremendous risk into the relationship themselves, but they don't usually notice it because they don't understand oxytocin bonding, emotional intimacy, and how it affects other people. So they don't recognize the hurt that they're actually inflicting. Most of my ethically avoidant clients, when they come into my coaching and I walk them through what this feels like, they are horrified at the idea that they've been accidentally hurting partners in the past and they're devastated. They, they honestly are really hurt that they have hurt somebody and they feel like they need to go apologize and make it right. They don't know how, but they feel like they have to. So the risks they bring is that they will get other people invested deeply, then they will pull back and it's like a rug pull where you pull that rug out from under someone else and they go flopping on their butt. That's how it feels in a relationship. Now, the anxious and avoidant people in relationships, the anxious people chase for approval, the avoidant people run like scared cats. It creates this running, chasing dynamic. A scared cat and anxious people are like a traumatized golden retriever. So put a traumatized golden retriever and a scared cat in a room, and that is the dynamic you see with anxious and avoidant partners, okay? You put them together, it can bring a lot of tremendous amount of potential risk and hurt. Now, the two hurt each other in a run, chase, escape, resent dynamic over and over and over. The avoidant person starts feeling overwhelmed. The novelty dopamine wears off about five to seven months. They start pulling away because they don't feel as good. The anxious person perceives abandonment and says, what did I do wrong? And they chase to say, no, I, I'll show you. I really love you. And they try to flood their partner with love and affection, which then scares that scared cat a avoidant person says, what are you doing? And they pull back because they feel their freedom being restricted. They feel unreasonable expectations. Again, diminished returns. They pull back further. The anxious person experiences withdrawals from the oxytocin being pulled away. Oh God, not again is what their feeling is from their two-year-old memory of being having that pulled away. They chase even harder. Now they start resenting. Now the avoidant person is constantly trying to escape. The anxious person is trying to play doormat, but also resenting this. It's an endless dance that sucks you guys. That's the clinical expression. It just sucks. Okay. <laughs> it's painful. It is unsustainable. It is unendurable. And neither side should really have to feel this. I'm not here to blame either buddy, either person. Okay. The avoidant person gets worse over time because they, they are prevented properly from bonding. So it feels like diminished returns. Plenty of these men do get married or women do get married and just settle in for diminished returns because they're at least hoping to raise a family and they're hoping that will bring some kind of fulfillment to them. They're trading any kind of joy or pleasure for hopefully building a family, okay? Awful, awful gamble and it doesn't have to be made that way, okay? Anxious people get worse over time because that, that cycle of, of I've given and given and given and given to you and now I'm resentful. I wrote a book on this. It's over my shoulder called Exhausted Wives, Bewildered Husbands. In that book, I talk about why so many wives that divorce their husbands at 20 years. It's usually this anxious and avoidant pattern right here. It's, that's why it happens. She gets so stressed out and resentful and miserable through 20 years. And he's thinking, what are you talking about? I've sacrificed everything I could possibly give you. I have nothing to give you left. Why are you still not happy? And they get a divorce and, and he's, he's completely confused about why. And she has this absolute rage story against him, how he's an unfeeling monster. And to their credit, both of them have really hurt each other usually over those 20 years. This is why I've started helping couples even at 30 or more years of marriage, and they're still suffering from this product, this process, okay? It does not get better on its own, you guys. It doesn't just go away. You can't just give the avoidant person enough space, and you can't just soothe the anxious person enough because it comes from those deep-seated attachment problems from childhood that the person's not even conscious of. So... This is not something that goes away. This is not something that gets, just gets magically better. If you talk about it in, in traditional, just talk therapy and couples therapy, couples therapy typically does not work. It usually makes things worse. I'm going to be honest with you. As a couples therapist, a former couples therapist myself, now as a couples coach, just traditional talk therapy. Hmm. How do you feel? Why do you feel that way? Why are you so mad? Wow. Well, how do you feel about their feeling? It, it really just runs you in circles as you rehash the same old misery and pain. You need more of a solution focused angle, especially one that addresses the core attachment issues. What often needs to happen is that the anxious person needs to understand that the avoidant person has never understood and none of this was malicious. And now they understand and they want to do something about it. 
The avoidant person needs to understand that the anxious person has not been in control of their behavior necessarily, but that it still is their responsibility, the anxious person, so then they need to see the anxious person taking responsibility for their emotions and then speaking to them in a clear, logical way that the avoidant person can understand. As you do this, it does rebuild trust. It usually takes a couple of sessions of really targeted coaching if you have somebody who's very, very trained and professional in this, okay? This is a massive problem, though, with repercussions and a gigantic price tag. Hundreds of thousands of dollars lost in divorce. Life savings gone. Homes gone. Children broken. Continuing patterns of generational brokenness that never gets better. An anxious partner and an avoidant partner do not have secure, healthy children. I'm just going to say that. Your kids come out worse and more miserable. This dynamic, though, can become healthier if both become what I call remade secure style, okay? Avoidance, avoidant people, when they become securely attached and fix those attachment issues, they don't run. They say, I see all these risks. I'm bringing to them to you. Let's have a discussion and solve them. They are very aware of that risk and they can solve problems like that. They're incredible solution finders and solution builders and solution implementers. They're phenomenal for this. Okay. Again, that's why that research seems to indicate that groups may benefit from the avoidant attachment style if one, if they can bond properly together. Okay. Anxious people, when they become, when they become remade secure are compassionate. They are intimate. Nobody understands what it's like to be in pain as much as them. And they are so empathetic and, and, and deeply loving and affectionate to other people, it's phenomenal and absolutely mandatory that they make this change so that they can give that love to other people without feeling like they themselves are unlovable. Now, avoiding an anxious people when they fit together, what I've seen through all my clinical experience and all my coaching experience is that when they fit together like that, the anxious person can finally give that fulfillment and fruitful love to their avoidant partner who just drinks it in like the desert pulls in rain because I've never had it before. And, and, and they trust that person now with their life. It's incredible to watch an anxious person fix an avoidant person. And the avoidant person teaches self-discipline and solution finding and, and, and self-strength and the strength of a relationship to the anxious person who has never felt power or control over their life ever. They can really nurture them in that way and the anxious person finally has a partner they can trust and feel safe with. Safety and fulfillment. These are the two things they give to each other and they're uniquely suited to be able to do that when they become secure together. Now, I'm going to say this. I've got couples every single day who are in my coaching practice, who are benefiting from that and who are learning this pattern. But most of you have no idea that I have a big newsletter that I put out every couple of days with tips and resources and special offers. Most of you here on this channel, 65,000 of you now at the time of recording, 65,000 of you don't know that I have a free newsletter, okay? If you drop down into the description below, you're gonna see that sign up for my free newsletter. Please get access to those exclusive benefits. Please sign up so that you can start getting those reminders, you can start getting those tips, those strategies, everything. If you love these videos, great. Imagine the core of these being pumped into your email inbox so you can start your day with that several times a week. That's the value. Please click that link in the description. Make sure you sign up. Now, the core message I want to leave you here with today about anxious and avoidant relationships is that anxious and avoidant partners can love each other. In fact, they can love each other more fully probably than anybody else on the planet once they become remade secure, but they can't do it if they stay anxious and avoidant, okay? And here's the core message. For anybody who's new on this channel, Attachment styles are not astrology signs or personality types. They can and must change. These are survival adaptations based on environment that you can change because you are not just a behavioral animal. You are a cognitive human being. And now through the course of this video and the hundreds of other videos on this channel, my courses, all of my material, you have the resources you need to make that change. So, Yes, these relationships with anxious and avoidant people can work, but only if both are willing to become remade secure together. This willingness, I'll tell you, is the one and only thing that I need as a coach to make any relationship work. No matter how bad things have been up to that point, the willingness is the one thing that you guys cannot compromise on. You mo both have to be willing to make this change. So if you're in a relationship like this right now, 
If you're in a relationship with an avoidant partner or an anxious partner and you're the other, ask right now, ask yourself, are you both willing to make changes? If those changes made sense to you, if those changes brought benefits for you, if you finally got the connection you'd been longing for, would you be willing to make a couple of changes right now? If so, then yes, you can make this work. Start with some conversations with your partner, even conversations about being willing to learn, being willing to grow together, being willing to experience something new together. Test that willingness. That's your starting conversation right there. See if that mutual desire is there. And if it is, then you can take some first steps into communication as a couple. I have a lot of those first steps, again, on my newsletter. I've been pumping them out. If you've missed them so far, please drop into the notes below in the description. Sign up for that newsletter. I don't want you to miss any more strategies or tips in there. And you can start having those correct conversations as a couple. Absolutely vital that you start talking together, okay? Thank you, everybody, for being here. Anyone who's new on this channel, I am Adam Lane Smith, the attachment specialist with 15 years of training and experience in this field, former licensed marriage and family therapist, retired from that so I can teach attachment on the global stage. I am here to help you build fruitful and fulfilling relationships for the rest of your life. So... I am going to see you in the next video for more details on what to do in an anxious and avoidant dynamic, okay? That next video is called, Can Anxious Avoidant Relationships Actually Work? I'm gonna go way more in depth this time. Follow me into that next video. I'll see you there.